Since the dawn of time, man has found refuge underground. Skeletons, cave drawings and ancient tools tell of our ancestors using caverns for shelter and as hiding places. As man became more adept at engineering, he was able to dig deeper and construct bigger and better underground structures. From smugglers' passages to hidden fortresses, from forgotten mines to wartime bunkers. Discover the secrets you were never supposed to know. Travel to the places you were never supposed to see in The Secrets of Underground Britain. Join us as we lift the lid on Britain's Cold War bunkers. From the tiny to the enormous, journey deep, deep underground as we reveal the places our government built to protect themselves and our country after the Second World War. Here is an emergency announcement. An air attack is approaching... We travel to one of the few remaining Royal Observer Corps bunkers on the tip of Cornwall. Uncover the places and the plans our government had to try to keep us going at Kelvton Hatch in Essex and another secret bunker near Anstruther in Scotland. And finally, we uncover the once secret location deep in the heart of Wiltshire that the British government itself planned to retire to had a nuclear war actually happened. The Cold War had led Britain to once again look underground for its safety and security. And in this programme, we'll uncover a series of underground structures designed to withstand an atomic explosion and enable our government to keep the country going in time of a nuclear war. The victory over Nazi Germany was a bittersweet pill to swallow. Britain and the Allies had won, but the nation was exhausted. Rationing continued, and in the late 40s, to the West's horror, Soviet Russia began testing atomic weapons. The Cold War had exploded into a deadly international showdown. This heralded an era of nuclear paranoia, spies and double agents, much of which was played out in clandestine cloak and dagger operations. The future looked grim, and for decades, Britain was deemed to be on the verge of a nuclear war. The government prepared scripts to be broadcast by the BBC from the safety of bomb-proof bunkers, and rehearsals were regularly staged to ensure both civilian and military personnel knew where to go and what to do if the sirens warned of a nuclear attack. While some of the bunkers would house hundreds and in some cases thousands of government officials, soldiers and ancillary staff, others were much more modest in scale. The one I'm about to visit here in Cornwall belonged to the Royal Observer Corps. When these bunkers were built, they were deliberately located in remote locations, so members of the public, or indeed spies, would be unlikely to stumble upon them, so they're not exactly easy places to get to. This is Verian, one of the hundreds of Royal Observer Corps bunkers placed all around the country. There are just two rooms. The very smallest room of the bunker, with the L-Tex chemical toilet. Every bunker should have one. And in here, the main room, it's tiny. I cannot imagine how difficult it must have been for the crew posted down here. Well, it's fairly uncomfortable because these places were designed to be basic survival units. Uh, there was no heat, there was no water, there were no main services apart from a telephone line. Uh, the uh, Air Ministry or the Observer Corps saw fit to issue us with duffel coats and said, well, that's all right, and try and keep warm. Well, this is a basic Royal Observer Corps monitoring post. Uh, it, it had 10 
uh, observers on it. Uh, any eight hours there were three observers operational crew and it was their role to simply man this place uh, and take readings to any nuclear bursts which may happen and also record the level of radioactivity sh should that occur. Uh, this place and indeed all the Royal Observer Corps posts were never manned in earnest because we never did have a nuclear war. We played our nuclear war games, we practiced, we had nuclear exercises uh, four or five times a, a, a year. Uh, but the idea was that had there been a tightening of the international situation and had the Royal Observer Corps been activated, then three observers would have come here, made it operational and served for eight hours. If nothing happened, there would be a change of shift, another, eight, another three observers would come on and serve another three hours. Had the balloon gone up when any three observers were on duty at any post, that would be the only crew that would ever serve because nuclear war is totally unlike a conventional war. Uh, you would not be changing over shifts in a nuclear situation. Well, when the post were originally built between 1955 and 1963 or 4, there were some 1,600 built. We had a big reorganisation in 1968 and uh, many of those posts were made redundant then. Uh, the number of posts went down to roughly 875 and between 1968 and 1991 uh, they, it stayed, they stayed at that level, about 875 and of course it all came to an end when communism collapsed and the Royal Observer Corps was uh, stood down in September 1991. The first indication of a nuclear burst down here will be a reading on the bomb power indicator. Uh, if that needle went up, then that will be reported to the parent operation room. Uh, and then 60 seconds after that, the papers in the ground zero indicator will be changed. That would mean a, an observer leaving the safety of this uh, post underground and going up top to change the papers. Uh, he would come down again with those papers, they will be assessed in terms of bearing elevation and the size of the spot in degrees and that information will be reported to the operations room as well. If we were downwind of a burst uh, then we would get fallout and that will be recorded on a device in the post called the fixed survey meter and had we uh, received first fallout then thereafter readings would be taken on that meter every five minutes and reported to the parent ops room and in that way the ops room would be able to plot areas of high intensity fallout and low intensity fallout and indeed more importantly areas which were free of fallout. Well thankfully uh, we never did have a nuclear war uh, and in that sense one could argue that the Royal Observer Corps was part of a successful deterrent and the government saw fit to disband uh, not only squadrons and regiments but also almost the whole of the Royal Observer Corps and we were stood down uh, on the 30th of September 1991. All these posts were made redundant um, and many of them were sold off, uh, many were demolished, uh, a, 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 some reverted to the original landowner in this particular case, Varian Post, they reverted to the National Trust. Thankfully they didn't demolish it and uh, we duly took it over and uh, restored it as part of our Royal Observer Corps heritage and we now open it up to the public. Those Royal Observer Corps lookouts would have reported to a secret regional headquarters, which itself would be hidden away, such as this one at Kelton Hatch in Essex. Massive bunkers built with high security cover and unobtrusive entrances that looked just like bungalows. But they were in reality guardhouses which stood sentry over a passage which led to a base where hundreds of staff, both military and civilian, would keep Britain running in the time of a nuclear war. The scale of these establishments is mind-boggling. Each is equipped with a war room, stations for an army of civil servants, 
a BBC radio studio so that the public outside could be kept appraised as to what was happening. A telephone exchange, a hospital, dormitories, private sleeping quarters for senior members of staff, and aware that all provisions would be in short supply, the government made sure that everything had a purpose. They even had a supply of labels printed to attach to the dead or wounded to make identification easier. In the early 1950s, there was certainly a bunker mentality. The threat from the Soviets uh, was very, very real. So everybody had bunkers. Britain was divided into regions, and each region had what was called a regional war room, which would be um, controlled by a regional commissioner. Um, so each region could be run separately if central government uh, had been taken out of action uh, and there was no way of getting in contact with central government or with other regions. Um, so London actually had uh, four war rooms. Uh, there was one in southwest, northwest, northeast, southeast, um, and, uh, but most of the other areas, for example, Nottingham, um, Tunbridge Wells, uh, Birmingham, Manchester, all those areas had regional war rooms. Kelton Hatch was originally built as an RAF bunker, but as the nuclear threat intensified, it was redesigned and redeployed to become the northeastern regional headquarters for London. One of its most important functions was the ability to keep in contact with both central government and the host of smaller bunkers that would be feeding them information on bomb drops and fallout patterns. With that in mind, the bunker was equipped with a telephone exchange that was wired into a secret phone network running all over the country. Fallout warning message, Maidstone, blank, 51, 52, 53, 55, 56, message ends. The most important thing about any uh, emergency bunker of this type, any civil defence, the, the, the important thing is communications. Government can't control the country if it can't communicate. Throughout the Second World War and in, in earlier years, telephone lines tended to go from city centre to city centre. And of course city centres are the bits that are most vulnerable to bombing, and the big cities in particular, like Birmingham and Manchester and London, are particularly vulnerable to bombing. So um, at the end of the Second World War and, and, and in, in the years after, the GPO, the General Post Office, um, predecessors to British Telecom, they started to lay new trunk lines, and they laid trunk lines that um, were routed around the big cities. And they built deep underground emergency telephone exchanges below all the, all the major cities as well, like Birmingham has got an underground telephone exchange called Anchor. Um, Manchester's got a, a deep underground telephone exchange called Guardian. There's the deep underground um, Kingsway ex exchange in London. As well as a secure phone system, Kelvin's other link with the outside world was via an air filtration plant that strained and filtered out any radioactive contamination from the air. All the larger nuclear bunkers had similar systems installed. Kelton was further protected by the fact it was located over 150 feet underground, which meant staff had a long, long trek to get in or get out. Kelvin is just one of the many similar bunkers scattered across the country. Another is hidden beneath a farmhouse near Amstruther, Scotland. It too was a secret regional headquarters spread over two levels and would have housed over 300 people, 100 feet beneath Scottish soil. Although it was kept hidden for over 40 years, today it survives as a tourist attraction known as Scotland's secret bunker. Whilst these bunkers are authentic nuclear shelters, over the years their use was changed and adapted for a variety of functions. Now they are open as museums and the artefacts in them reflect the bunkers' uses at a variety of times over their history. 
many of the original items were stripped out, and the present owners have gone to great lengths to replace the missing artefacts with equipment that will give us an idea of how the shelters would have looked when in commission. What changed was the development of the nuclear bomb as opposed to the atomic bomb. An atomic bomb may be an equivalent of 20,000 tonnes of TNT. A nuclear bomb, you're talking about millions of tonnes of TNT, so a completely different measure of things. And the threat posed by the nuclear bomb called for a different civil defence response. It called for bigger and deeper and more hardened bunkers. So by 1958, these regional war rooms had been pretty well abandoned. A whole new raft of bunkers were, be, were under construction then, deep underground. The majority of these bunkers were originally built during World War II and were re-engineered for the Cold War, such as this RAF bunker in Epping Forest that was reborn as a regional nuclear headquarters and Langley Lane Bunker in Lancashire, which started life as a World War II group headquarters and then became part of the Royal Observer Corps, before finally being converted into a regional government centre. Most of these bunkers were built in rural areas, but the 1960s saw one constructed right in the middle of a housing estate in South London. We're in Lunham Road, SE19, just down the hill from Crystal Palace where the TV masts are. And this is Pear Tree House. It's the most unusual bunker you can imagine. The basement is two floors, and that's the bunker. And this was built in the early 1960s to provide a safe haven for local government for South East London. The function of the bunker, as with um, the regional government headquarters, was to provide a safe haven for government officials uh, science officers who could actually uh, determine uh, where the danger areas were in the event of a nuclear strike. Um, so it, it operated as a control centre. Um, uh, the individual borough controls, the Royal Observer Corps posts would all have reported uh, to this group control and they would have uh, been able to plot uh, the direction of any fallout, uh, the position of any bombs uh, and exactly which areas were safe, um, which airports could remain open and exactly how London could remain functioning in the event of a nuclear attack. When this bunker was designed in the 1960s the idea was to have an ordinary four-storey block of flats with the bunker beneath it so that people would actually be living on top of the bunker. But by the time the bunker was completed in 1966, uh, civil defence planning had changed, so its life was short-lived. In 1968, civil defence was stood down and the bunker became surplus to requirements and was placed on care and maintenance. The original generator from the 1960s is still in full working order and looks as new as the day it was fitted. In London, civil defence was reactivated in 1973, so uh, the bunker was totally refurbished over a six-year period and was brought back into use as the South East uh, Group Control in 1979. This centre remained in use until 1993. Um, the borough controls would have reported to here and this in turn would have reported to the regional government headquarters at Kelvin Hatch. Sadly today the bunker is closed to us because the council have discovered asbestos in there. But I've been in uh, a few times and uh, the layout is uh, quite clear to interpret. Behind us you'll see the massive steel blast door. Uh, that forms an airlock, so you've got two doors. Uh, once you're through those doors you're almost immediately into the central control room. Uh, the walls have maps of the boroughs on all walls and uh, next to that is the communications room where there would have been booths with uh, telephone operators so all of the agencies uh, reporting to uh, this bunker would have uh, telephoned in and then the messages could have been passed through uh, to the controllers in the control room. On the roof the two radio masts that would have supported the aerials are still to be seen to this day. The use of bunkers was forever changing. Um, in fact, many of their uses changed before they were completed. Uh, uh, even at the end of the Cold War, a lot of new bunkers were being built and it was often cheaper to finish them and not commission them than actually cancel the contract to, to complete the bunker. Uh, so we had a lot of bunker building still going on in, in the early 1990s. But it wasn't just people that needed protecting if Britain was to carry on after a nuclear attack. The basic utilities needed protection too. 
and the most basic of utilities is water. In times of war, this was the vital thing to keep flowing to the general public. And it's in here we're going to meet John Foxley, who had a very important job. John, good to see you. Hi, good morning. Hi. Tell me about the place. Right, this is a nuclear fallout shelter. It was built about uh, 14, 15 years ago to accommodate up to 50 people in the event of a nuclear fallout uh, type of situation so that we could keep the water supply side of the uh, process under good control. Now, the first thing I noticed were these huge doors that are ever so heavy. Literally, is that a, a blast door of some sort? Oh, it is fantastic, actually, yes. They are uh, with, built to withstand the ordinary sort of nuclear blast, uh, and they are intended to actually screen out all the effects of nuclear radiation. Having been outside, uh, you would need, obviously, to wash off the contamination with the uh, shower units that we've got here. And then, as you pass in through the rest of the bunker, let me show you, the first of all, the washroom. Okay. And this is, obviously, a key facility here, uh, but pre with pretty meagre facilities. How meagre were they? Well, they, uh, if you like, just uh, try the facility here and just right. uh, wash your hands. How, how do I do it? It's all by uh, means of pumping. There right. it goes. Careful, that's all we can spare. What, is that it? That's it. And we should recycle that as well. It's got to last us for two months. What else have we got in here apart from very little water? Well, we have uh, chemical closets uh, which have to be uh, used in a normal sort of caravan situation and they're pumped out to waste periodically and so on. And through the doorway, we've got the actual water tanks for storage. The water tanks themselves are there to actually last 50 people for two months. Although this bunker is more modern than the others we've seen, the basic principles remain the same. This is the air filter plant, which cleaned and purified the air, allowing the staff to get on with their work safely. My job with Southern Water was to act as the regional water supply manager for the southeast of England. What does that mean? What it means is that I'll be responsible for trying to actually maintain water supplies to up to two million people in the southeast of England, but specifically as far as this facility is concerned, to provide water supply in the Hastings area. So there are bunkers like this essentially all over the country that would be looking after those important utilities? Yes, dotted around all over the country to keep that vital uh, service of water supply uh, running as much as possible and in a safe way. So we've got the mess room here and the canteen just through the uh, opening there which is uh, enough really to, enough space for 20 or 22 people to sit down at one go. And through here is our rather special secret. It's still left over from when the bunker was originally built. This is a Faraday cage. This is the key place for uh, communicating in and out of the bunker facility here. Now I remember this as part of my studies when I studied engineering. These are important because when a nuclear bomb goes off, they emit all sorts of horrendous waves, the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse. And I take it this is in here to protect computers and stuff like that, because all computers would be rendered useless, wouldn't it, in the event of a nuclear attack? Absolutely right. And of course, uh, on the run-up to a nuclear attack, the key bits of kit would actually be put in here for safekeeping anyway. Now, it's fair enough looking after the computers and the technology, but what about you? Even your family didn't know that in time of nuclear attack, you'd be the one coming in here? Yes, I'd be one of 50 coming in here. My family at the time, uh, I'm sure, would have been pretty upset and gutted by the whole thing. Personally, I would have felt so also, because uh, I would have been in here, uh, away from not only my family, uh, but also away from the operational chaps that are, I'd be reliant upon to keep the show on the road. Now, one of the amazing things of these places is that the age of them, they go back quite a long way. This really isn't that old at all, is it? It's extraordinary, this one, because this one was uh, built in 1988 and it was finished in 1992, which is a matter of just a few months after the Berlin Wall came down. It's extraordinary how the Cold War melted, really. We have seen bunkers of every size and shape. 
from tiny Royal Observer Corps dens that house just three or four, to massive regional headquarters that could house hundreds. But at the start of the Cold War, there was one place that was less of an underground bunker and more of a subterranean city. Its tunnels and roadways stretch in a seemingly endless maze, and it's to here that we take our next trip. A place that few people have heard of, and even fewer have visited. So now we know that all over Britain there are a series of bunkers so that the local authorities could coordinate any cleanup after a nuclear strike and run any military response needed locally. But what a central government? Where would the Prime Minister, the Cabinet and the top military brass run the whole show? Now intelligence suggested that London would be heavily bombarded, so a base that could take not hundreds but thousands of people was needed outside of the capital. And the site that was officially selected was here in Corsham in Wiltshire. Up until a few years ago, this bunker didn't officially exist and was subject to the strictest levels of security. But in this day of open and accountable government, the MOD officially acknowledged its existence in 2004. When I came here in August uh, 04, this was, uh, was classed as a, a top secret site uh, to do with the bunker. So it was a question I put forward, because I was maintaining it then as, as a secret bunker. Uh, but with this uh, change of scenario, there was a view of, uh, do we still need it? That was questioned, uh, Parliament considered it, and, and I got a letter from the Prime Minister saying, no, you can decommission it. So in December 2004, it was decommissioned. That allowed me to open it up then, to, to, go, uh, to allow people to go and see what was down there, to see what we had in that era underground so this top secret as it was is no longer top secret and probably reflects the the changing world that we're living in this is andy quim he's the mines manager for the mod here at caution andy what's that round building behind us it's actually one of the main air intake shafts and that takes air into the facility itself now this is the entrance itself is it the original one it's the original entrance uh, into the nuclear facility and what we have is a nuclear-proof surface building giving passenger access down below. Would you like to follow me? And here we are. What safety issues do you have here? Well, first and foremost, yours. We better get Caution was originally a quarry that was purchased by the government during World War II and converted into an ammunition store and aircraft factory with over 25,000 people working there every day. During the Cold War, a previously unused section was converted into a nuclear-proof bunker codenamed Burlington. Area 10 is a work area. It was so vast that motorised buggies were not just convenient, but essential to travel around its acres of maze-like roadways. Well, the importance of caution is it's where government would have gone had there been a nuclear war. And caution has several different roles. In fact, no one in government even seems to know really quite what caution's role would have been during the war. Um, initially, it was sort of a hub for the regional seats of government because although in the mid-1950s had there been a war they um, wanted to devolve government to the regions, central government was loath to let go of a lot of these functions and they thought of themselves as like the spider in the middle of a web and you, you would have all of these outlying regional bunkers but um, grand policy would still have been determined from, from central government and that would have been the role of caution. We do know that Area 15 would have been the administrative area. Down through there? Area 15. I'm surprised that the road... You actually have road names underneath it. Well, of course, they had to designate the, the road names, but actually they're all geographic. Uh, the, we're on East Main at the moment, and obviously we're heading eastwards, and it's the main road. Despite Corsham's top-secret status, over the years enough information has seeped out about its existence to fuel all kinds of speculation as to what was down here. There are stories abounding about the facility down here. At one time, we were said to be the UK's Area 51. 
we have alien spacecrafts down here and we have experimentation with aliens. Which you people need to think that. Well, I can go ahead and think that. You get lots of rumours because it is so different. You know, if I took people down today and there were some areas I couldn't go into because of health and safety issues and the doors are closed, they'd be convinced that behind those particular doors would be the UFO. Well, there's not. <laughs> not that I've found, anyway. Just grab your torch off the okay. seat. And there would have been actually three separate government departments all working in this area. Um, the area is basic offices, and if you'll notice, the walls only go two-thirds away up to the ceiling. And this room has been set out as basically office. So this is exactly as it would have been? Exactly as it would have been. Including a bed? Sleeping duty. The guys would have had to have gone on uh, duty for 24-hour periods. The papers are all from the uh, date of the facility. Now, this one's dated 1967. But this here kind of gets me scared. Nuclear Training, All Arms, Volume 1, pamphlet number 2. That's the name of the game. They were down here to survive a nuclear war. Everything that you see in this room was, in fact, stored in the facility itself. Including this Imperial typewriter. Lovely, aren't they? And this is the kitchen and canteen area. This place is huge. Yes, it is. This part, this canteen, would actually support about 2,000 people. Uh, scheduled to run from about 4 o'clock in the morning through to 10 o'clock in the evening. So there were set meal times for individual um, departments. Now, it seems incredible that all this stuff here um, just seems totally unused. Never any food served, never any food cooked. And of course the working area at the back is the kitchens, fridges and preparation areas. Back in the 1950s, this cavernous kitchen was fitted with all the latest ovens, mixers and washing equipment to handle an army of civil servants. And to this day, none of it has ever been used. It's as if time has stood still for almost 50 years. And of course, this is the dining area and coffee lounge. But aren't these coffee machines fabulous? They wouldn't be amiss in Rome or New York. Actually made in Oldham. Whilst Caution was built to house the cream of Whitehall civil servants and the top echelons of the government, the facilities are, to put it mildly, Spartan, and they were expected to use communal washrooms, cafes and dormitories. This is the main storage place for the whole facility. Anything that was required, they would find here. The different areas would reflect what the government required as per Whitehall. So everything that the government had to govern would be replicated down here because this was an area where the whole of the government would actually be. 4,000 civil servants and approximately 1,000 support staff. Every piece of equipment, every piece of paper, everything the government needed from pencils, toilet rolls, cooking equipment, beds, furniture, Apart from desks, not one desk in the whole facility, but I do have 4,000 folding tables. Some has uh, obviously been moved out since declassification, but a lot of what was there, we still have. The world supply of waste paper bins, and also the world supply of ashtrays, and flat-packed file trays. Years ahead of their time. So Years ahead of their time. Very organic and green. <laughs> There's about 240 acres of underground city, you know, 26 miles or so of roadways and, and, and walkways and systems. So you add the food that would be necessary, the storage areas, the beds, the kitchens and canteens. It is effectively a city. And the priority for the population of that city would be clear 
to ascertain exactly what was happening above ground all over the British Isles. Because if the ministers found themselves relocated from Whitehall to Corsham and were working from the Burlington bunker, then it could only mean one thing. World War III had started. Nuclear burst original. Name 01 Alpha. In time of war, communications is everything. We've already seen throughout this programme the bunkers with their small communications bay. Well, they're all connected to here in Corsham, the headquarters. And let's just say that this place is, well, just a little bit bigger. The important thing about the Caution Bunker was to maintain communications with every aspect of life in the country. So, for instance, underground here was this, this huge, absolutely fantastic telephone exchange, old-fashioned plugboard telephone exchange. And the, the thing about these plugboard exchanges, which you know you, you think are sort of dating from the interwar years, is that they're very simple. And the most important thing is they're completely immune from electromagnetic pulse, which was a bit of an imponderable. You know, the scientists knew that the electromagnetic pulse from um, a nuclear explosion would have a pretty dramatic effect on any kind of electronic equipment, including electronic, um, uh, you know, radio equipment, um, electronic telephone exchanges, and all the rest of it. But by keeping to this really old-fashioned mechanical plug-board exchange system, that they knew that it would be immune from an electromagnetic pulse. So that's why you've got this really, really old technology still in use. 54 position exchange. When it was put in, it was the second largest of its kind. Um, it is the largest left in situ, obviously, and I wish there was a museum big enough to take it, but that's a problem for me. Into the hospital area. A small hospital for the size of the facility, actually only six wards. It's strange to think that had there been a nuclear war, prime ministers such as Eden, Wilson, Heath, and right up to Thatcher could have been treated here. And of course, every hospital must have its kitchen. Keep the staff happy. And this is the small hospital kitchen. Well, I recognise pretty well most things here, but what's that? Ah, well, if you consider the type of persons that would be actually using this facility, at 10 o'clock every morning, high-level civil servants would have a cup of tea, a slice of toast, and a pat of butter. And they would use this machine? And they would use this machine to actually make the pats of butter. Well, it's good to know in times of nuclear war that the civil servants of the day will still get their butter. And this is the library and map room, and this is where the British government brought together all the information it thought it would require to carry on governing the country if London was destroyed. The effects of atomic weapons, and of course, they were only Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Every type of industry would be represented because they might need to rebuild the country. Colliery Guardian, Admiralty Charts, the whole of the UK coastline, um, trade documents, pilots, Navy pilots, who's who, international who's who. One more thing I have noticed that before, that before we move on. Why does the British government need a dartboard? Ah, uh, standard um, MOD operations. <laughs> mm. 
Okay, now this is the Lampson room, and very Lampson. basic. Yes, Lampson. It's the name of the company that devised this system, and it's a internal messaging system. Very basically, you have a message pod in which you can place a tight piece of paper, roll it up, pop it in there, put it back up, and then the address would be on these two brass sleeves, which you can rotate round to define where it's going. And then, just pop it into the correct tube, and off it would go. Compressed air system, vacuum system. It's a metal system and would have been incredibly noisy. Now, they would come all then into here, because this is effectively the exchange, isn't yes, it? Yes, this is the, the main registry or comsem, is the modern day equivalent. Right. So the operator would actually stand here, there would probably be two or three operators, but it also tells us which of the areas were the more important. I mean, you see here area 21, which was the government communications area, that's got quite a few lamps and receivers. And of course the generators next door. Of all the secret bunkers that we've been privileged to visit, Corsham is undoubtedly the most impressive. Incredibly, we've hardly scratched its surface, as there are acres of other dormitories, offices and passages within its grounds. All of them designed and built with one purpose in mind, to protect the government and keep the country running during World War III. It's been remarkable to see Corsham with our very own eyes. It truly is a secret we were never supposed to know, a place we were never supposed to see. But what does the future hold for Corsham now the Cold War's over and the bunker has been decommissioned? It is an unmanned facility, but parts of it are still maintained and utilised by the MOD. I would like it to continue so that in 50 years' time, somebody else can look back at this era and say that was part of the quarry history. I'm working very closely with English Heritage and Defence Estates and ourselves and the MOD to, to try and provide the opportunity. Uh, in some cases it will be possible, in others it won't be. But yes, there's a lot of effort going in to restore and maintain what we can for the future. On November the 9th, 1989, after civil unrest and the resignation of the East German head of state, Erich Honecker, the gates in the Berlin Wall were unlocked. The crowds climbed upon it and tore it down. This is perhaps the most significant event marking the end of the Cold War. The Cold War may have finished, but it hasn't stopped Britain building underground secrets. And many of them are in places you wouldn't expect. This is the Tamar Bridge, built in 1961, a uh, fairly standard suspension bridge. At the time it was the longest suspension bridge in the country, now it's the fourth longest. Um, the, the suspension bridge it consists of uh, two towers with the main cable suspended over the top of the towers. Think of it as a, a big washing line if you like, with two line props supporting the line. And uh, everything is then suspended from the bridge, the road and the hangar cables. We've got uh, four anchorage chambers, there's one on each corner of the suspension bridge and the anchorage chambers are the strength and the integrity of the whole bridge. If we go back to our washing line, the washing line is fixed uh, to one fence post and one fence post on either side of the garden and uh, that's what gives the, the washing line its strength. And the same with the suspension bridge, we've got the main cable which uh, drapes over the two towers on either side of the river, one on the Plymouth side and one on the Saltash side of the, of the river. And, um, they're anchored into the ground using reinforced concrete and this is what gives the suspension bridge its strength and integrity. The main cable uh, enters the anchorage chamber and the main cable is made up of 31 individual wires, individual ropes if you like. Those 31 cables, as they enter the anchorage, they split into separate individual anchorage points and that means the loads and the stresses on the cable are all spread through the earth uh, into the anchorage point, so we're not putting one big point load onto the ground. The anchorage chambers are all very similar throughout the country and indeed throughout the world, so 
road bridge like Forth, like Humber, uh, similar to Severn, those, those suspension bridges will have these, these underground chambers, these sort of secret places that nobody really gets to see and they're, they're the real sort of bowels of the bridge. And our final underground secret is home to a remarkable scheme, housed in a bomb-proof bunker in the basement of this futuristic-looking laboratory. The nuclear threat may appear to be over, but recovering from an ecological or biological disaster is now a high priority in the 21st century. The Millennium Seed Project aims to collect and store thousands of seeds from every country across the planet. So if a species is lost in the wild, mankind has a fighting chance to try and reintroduce it. It is about saving 10% of the world's flora as seeds by 2010. This is a bunker built for the future um, and it's a bunker built to help us avoid, uh, I suppose, an environmental problem. We have a situation where quite a lot of the species from on which our livelihoods were first based and now being threatened with extinction due to our habitat changes and the way we live our lives. So this is a, a technological solution at least to hanging on to the foundation stones and building blocks of the livelihoods from where we came. When scientists worked out the expected rate of loss due to deforestation and other man-made phenomena, they were alarmed to find that plants were being lost at 70 to 100 times the rate they expected. This state-of-the-art bunker was designed to start the fight back before it was too late. The dream was that we wouldn't sit by and wring our hands about the damage to the habitat that's going on and the loss of plant species, we actually do something about it to make sure that that damage was as limited as it could be with the efforts of a small group of people. Around 60 experts were assembled to man the lab, which was fitted with vast chilled storage rooms to keep the seeds in peak condition for the longest possible time. The project has agreements with over 17 countries in almost every continent around the world. And a further 40 people across those continents are collecting, cataloguing and sending seeds back to the Millennium Seed Bank. You could say on a sunny day, at the risk of incurring the wrath of others, that the sun never really does set on the Millennium Seed Bank project somewhere in the world. It's light and people are doing their best. The Cold War produced perhaps the wider selection of secret underground locations that we know about today. Bunkers built at a time when there was a good chance that a nuclear Armageddon could be unleashed at any moment. The policy now is not to build any new bunkers. Um, I'm fairly satisfied there aren't any bunkers that we don't actually know about. There are certainly bunkers we, don't, uh, we haven't been able to get in yet. Um, but the military still use bunkers. Um, Strike Command at High Wycombe is still run from a bunker. Um, but a modern bunker is not like a bunker that, that, that we know and love. It's really just an underground office block uh, and they really are quite boring. There's nothing to beat a two-level operations room with a gallery with windows looking down onto the map tables below, the people pushing the tanks along with sticks. That, that's my idea of a good military bunker. As we have seen, many of these lay forgotten, derelict and abandoned. But others must still be in operational use, even today. So the next time you walk over a manhole, see a tunnel in the side of a hill, or maybe even see a strangely locked door, just consider what secrets might be lurking within.